Moments ago, standing together with her wife, Sherelle, uh, in the Oval Office, I spoke with Brittany Griner. She's safe. She's on a plane. She's on her way home. After months of being unjustly detained in Russia, held under intolerable circumstances, Brittany will soon be back in the arms of her loved ones, and, uh, and she should have been there all along. Um, today, my family is whole, but as you all are aware, there's so many other families who are not whole. And so, BG's not here to say this, but I will gladly speak on her behalf and say that BG and I will remain committed to the work of getting every American home, including Paul, whose family is in our hearts today as we celebrate BG being home. We do understand that there are still people out here who are enduring what I endured the last nine months of missing tremendously their loved ones. So thank you everybody for your support. Um, and today it's just a happy day for me and my family. So um, I'm gonna smile right now. <laughs> um, thank you. All right, welcome to Brother From Another. Michael Holly here alongside Ashley Nicole Moss. What's up, Ashley? <laughs> Good to see you. Hi, I'm excited to Thanks be for here. Well, you should be. You should be. First of all, you, uh, you know, you're, you're an award winner. Uh, you, you're getting all kinds of praise. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that a little later. But uh, obviously, the news of the day, you know, we start the show with, you know, what you heard. That was President Biden. And then Sherelle Griner, uh, the wife of Brittany Griner. The news has finally come. The, fi the news has finally arrived. We've been talking about it for 300 days. Yeah. But after 300 days, uh, Ashley, Brittany Griner is coming <clears throat> home uh, from Russia, the United States. And well, you know what? Actually, I'm going to correct myself because we haven't been talking about it for 300 days. We've probably been talking about it for, you know, 200 or, or, or 220 because there were times when it was a big mystery and it wasn't a big topic of conversation. And even right. when that when the when, when people found out about it, some people were persistent and talked about it every day. Uh, some people talked about it when it was convenient uh, or some people didn't mention it at all. Right. But this is, I, I think this is the work of the, 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 the assist, the W goes to several people. And I'll, I'll say this and I'll pass it to you. Goes to the WNBA, the women of the WNBA who once again get stuff done. Uh, you know, That's I can right. take it. I can take it a step further. They get stuff done. It's like Lil Rel's character in uh, in in Get Out. Hey, we're TSA. <laughs> we get stuff done. You know, they do. <laughs> WNBA, whether it is talking about uh, pol U.S. politics, domestic politics, uh, policy between uh, Raphael Warnock and and Kelly Loeffler, Warnock and uh, Herschel Walker, or in this case. The WNBA knows how these women know how to mobilize. They know how to get their messaging together and they know how to make a statement that has impact. So WNBA uh, props to those women who are all about it. Props to those who continue to have the conversation, who are relentless yeah. in their conversations about it. Men and women who refuse to let this just be a hashtag or just uh, a feed item uh, on brother from another. but we're willing to say, oh no, this is not good enough. We're going to keep pressing. We're going to keep asking questions until right. the result, until we get the result that we're looking for. And that result happened today, Ashley, uh, a celebratory way, a, cel a celebratory day in a lot of ways, but uh, a day as Sherelle referenced, uh, tinged with some sadness too, because there are some other political prisoners who are not going home. Absolutely. I mean, first and foremost, welcome home, BG. We've missed you. We're happy to have you back. And it's disheartening to see the response. I mean, it's it's not surprising, but it's disheartening. You know, I'm somebody who, one of my character flaws, Michael, is I try to see the good in everybody. I try to I try to see the good rather than focus on the things that they're showing me and, and think that a leopard can change its spots, but sometimes they can't. And at the end of the day, you know, one 
you know, a, a win for one doesn't negate the importance of another. And what I mean by that is that it seems that the release of Brittany Griner for some people means that Paul Whelan and the Whelan family are not important. And that's not the case. I want to specify that. What that means is that they are drastically different situations. And with drastically different situations comes a different game plan, a different blueprint. That deal was not on the table. And basically what people are saying on social media without realizing it is that you know because you couldn't get both that you should have left them both there and that's not how that works you know whether you're a fan of the w whether you have you know your opinions on whatever the case of the the at the end of the day the case remains this britney griner is an american and we are American, she is one of us, and she is coming home, and that's what should be celebrated. Now, yes, there are intricacies, and there are things that are unfortunate, and then there, you know, there are things that you're disappointed about, whether it was the amount of time it took for it to happen, the fact that we still have Americans in Russian prisons, and then they are not reunited with their families for the holidays, for the new year, and they've been there X amount of time, longer than Brittany Griner, I understand all of that. But we do not have to go ahead and tarnish a joyous, just monumentous occasion for not only Brittany Griner, not only the WNBA, not only this country, but her family, this person who has been separated from her loved ones in just most intolerable just environment. And, and we don't have to go ahead and negate that celebration in order to reflect and put a highlight on the importance of the others that are still there. And that's my disappointment with the way that this has been perceived by a lot of people on social media. Well, well let's talk about that a little bit more. Let's bring in, uh, we've got a couple of guests uh, who know, uh, who are well informed on this topic and many other topics. Uh, friends of the show. Uh, look at this. Look at this. Hi, uh, and, and great shirt. Hey, <laughs> Tarika Foster Brasby, what a shirt. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us. And Sabria Whitaker is here as well. So let's just get, let's continue this conversation. I mean, it is the story of the day when this news broke. I mean, there were celebrations, there were tweets, there were lots of conversations, as Ashley mentioned, just people with a variety of opinions on what this means for Brittany Griner, her family. And for the rest of us, uh, Tarika, I'll start with you and then Sabria, pick it up from there. Tarika? Yeah, um, this was absolutely um, a, a momentous occasion. I, I listened to Ashley open the show and I couldn't agree with you, you know, more. Um, I was actually asleep. I was knocked out. It was 930 in the morning um, and my husband tapped me and said, um, Tarika BG is free. And I hopped up because it felt like my own sister had been released. It felt like my family had like this was a part of my family and i think that's the the larger thing from a celebratory standpoint right now is just we all feel who've been following this story from the beginning who have a connection in some way or another to the wnba and specifically to the plight and, and what we've seen um these players go through it felt very personal for us for, for this to be happening to Brittany. Um, those, any of us who've ever had an interaction with her, anybody who's ever had an interaction with her knows that she is so impactful to you. She's been impactful to this game that it felt like a, a, an emptiness was felt across this league without her. And so to see Sherelle excited, to hear that people were excited, to know that she was on a plane on the way home, it was just a sense of relief and a sense of happiness. And I Honestly, the best way that we could have started this morning. That's right. Uh, Sabria, what did you think uh, when, when you heard it? And, and what are you thinking now that now that you've had some time to, to think about the impact of this uh, of this release? Yeah, I could not have been more excited like Tarika. I didn't know it just my phone was just buzzing and buzzing. I'm like, what is going on? And I just I wanted to cry like this is the best news I think we could have gotten how to end the year, coming into the year, um, everything that this would mean for the conversation, the many conversations that are happening, whether it's around players having to go overseas, um, what we can all do uh, to make sure that Americans are brought home, just everything that it means for the league. And I think it's a great conversation and I hope it keeps happening, but there's a lot of listening and learning um, as well. Yeah, all right, well, absolutely. Listen, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was just I gonna say let's let, let let's have that conversation. I, I I'd like to have that conversation. Let's start that one right now. Uh Sabria, you referenced it. Let's 
let's drill down some more. What do we need to because I mean, like what 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 should we be talking about uh, with with women's professional basketball uh, with the WNBA? Like what what are some of those conversations that that now that we've got the world's attention? Let's not just say, okay, she's home. Let's move on back to our lives. Where should we be staying and, and, and having conversations? Well, first, I would really like to have the conversation. Um, of course, we don't want this to happen again, but I think this was a very teachable moment um, where we all felt stuck and confused and we didn't really know what to do. So I would like to have more conversations um, about ensuring the safety of players uh, that do go overseas and maybe a, an action plan for if something like this ever happens again. But when we're talking about what we can do while they're over here, I want to do more than just have the conversation. I want those in positions of power who have opportunity for them, the gatekeepers, to give them the opportunities, open up your pockets, open up your purses, and let's figure out how we can help them get more paid opportunities in sports, in the things that they want to do over here. And those who maybe have never heard of BG before and are hearing the name now, you've tweeted, um, we've gotten her home. So let's support all of the players, whether it's talking about them, tweeting about them positively, might I add, but going to games and just seeing what you can do as an individual, even if you're not a major corporation that can offer them a job. Yeah, and I would add to that that I think it also part of this conversation is using your voice effectively. One of the reasons that this was even able to happen was because people continue to use their voice and their platform effectively. There was a point in time during this ordeal when we were told, hey, listen, we want negotiations to be smooth. We want to try to keep this under the radar. But that only worked for so long. It, it became a bigger deal because people in the media, people across the W, people who cared about the sport and cared about the players did what they needed to do in order to keep her name alive, to keep the story alive. And so when we turn on our social media and when we look at people who have this platform, like other athletes, we it, it hasn't just been the W that has been trying to help to, to bring attention to this. The NBA players, um, players in tennis, players in other sports have also supported the cause of Brittany Griner. So with that, you also have players and people and athletes and others who have had a platform that they could have used to help better this situation, to help bring positive light to the situation, to help educate those who did not know and instead have chosen to use that platform to kind of be emotional, to kind of use that platform to spew unresearched information, uneducated information. And that is what we really need to fight against. And so what I would say is that part of moving forward is continuing to understand if we're blessed with a platform and we're blessed with an opportunity to make change, positive change, let's continue to do that in the best way forward. And if we don't know how to do that, let's ask, let's figure it out. Ooh. Let's ask the people who do know, let's research in it. And when I say research, listen, I'm gonna I'm I'm tell you what I mean by research, right? You know how you know how people be like, do your research, girl, do your research. Research doesn't necessarily mean you're about to sit in the library for 50 hours with a book. That's not what it means. What it means is open up your mind and ability to educate yourself with people who know more than you. To, to, to do the little things like open up. Google is free. And I ain't saying everything on Google is correct, but there are enough correct sources out there. And people with platforms have access to others with those sources who can get you the information that you need and the most opportune way for you to be able to educate others, not running to social media emotionally, spewing off things that are incorrect when you have millions or hundreds of thousands of followers who will then take that information and go down the wrong path with it. So that's all that Absolutely. I think that, you know, what we need to do in my opinion is just to continue to educate each other and in that educate ourselves. Oh, Reverend no, Brasley. Listen, the first thing I learned in journal yeah. journalism school, my professor said day one, words are powerful and that they are. So I could not have said it any better myself. That's exactly what this comes down to. And I hope that, again, like you both mentioned, like we all mentioned, and I think we can all agree, it does not happen again. But I hope that if it does, it's a learning opportunity for not only, you know, fans of the game, not only non-fans of the game, but us as media personalities, us as people with platforms to go ahead and correctly 
and honestly report stories and not go ahead and be afraid to rock the boat when doing so, because that is the oath we all took as journalists. And I feel like, although we turned the corner, we could have done a better job at the beginning with this entire Brittany Griner situation and hopefully maybe even possibly made a difference sooner. Now, I, I, I've said this before, and, and I, I say it with admiration, but I'm, I'm going to uh, take Reverend Brasby's advice here. I'm going to ask people <laughs> who know more than I do. And I, it, just tell me, like, you, you both, uh, uh, Tarika and Sabria, you both have covered the uh, uh, WNBA, and you've seen some of, these, uh, some of these athletes up close, and you listen to them. What is it? What is it about some of these impactful WNBA athletes that allows them like more more than I've seen in a long time that allows him to diagnose an issue, identify it, align, get aligned, get the messaging right, and then make something happen. That sounds easy. I just made it sound easy. It's not. What have you observed in two pretty high profile cases? I know they didn't do it all by themselves, but I mentioned Warnock. It was not a coincidence. They made they got Warnock to the Senate. And they mm. helped spur this avalanche mm. uh, of, of commentary that helped that put pressure on on President Biden and, and uh, to bring Brittany Griner home. Why? Why are they able to do this so effectively? I know the answer, but I'm Tariqa. excited for. But I'm excited for it. I know the answer, though. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because you know exactly what I'm about to say. Black I know exactly women. what you're about to say. Black women. Mm -hmm. Black women. That is what yes. we do and what we have been doing from the beginning of time is making a way out of no way, seeing that there's a problem, figuring out how to diagnose it and doing it. And a lot of times it's been because we've had no other choice. There are not too many people fighting for Black women. So in the cases of the WNBA, there aren't sons of people that are out here fighting for them. They had to learn how to fight for themselves. And a part of that means being able to stand up for yourself, not being allowed to be disrespected, educating yourself in a way that you know exactly what you need to do in order to turn the corner for yourself. So when that happened with Kelly Loeffler, as that started to happen with Brittany Griner, it was just natural mode. We went into gear to do exactly what it is that we do. And so... I, I can't, th I, I honestly can't see a way that there is another answer to this question other than that is just what black women do. They've been doing it for years. They do it effectively. And as long as we continue to be in spaces where people don't fight for us, we'll continue to do it even more. Sabria, so, sis, hey, hey. Hey, so I, Michael, I, <laughs> Michael, I told you I was excited for the answer and that was why. Hey, I knew hey, what was coming. Hey, hey, listen, listen, Ashley and Sabria, before Sabria answers, I just want to say thank you, mom. Thank you, mom. And I say that for my own mother, my own mother, Marilyn Holly, shout out. But I'm saying that to all moms. Okay, thank you, mom. You're right. That's a great answer, Tarika. Uh, Sabria, would you like to expand on it? I'm sure you have a similar answer. Would you like to expand? Yes, that's exactly right. I mean, those are two great examples, but you have to go back even further when we talk about all of the other tragedies that have happened. They've been speaking out. I mean, there was years ago, Minnesota Lynx players, right, protested. Like, they started a lot of the uh, pregame protests with shirts and the whole anthem situation, and they risked, like, upsetting the police officers that were at their games and just left and refused to be, you know, uh, off-the-clock officers for Minnesota Lynx players. So they've been risking it, and it's because... As a black woman, you do not have the privilege of being white and you do not have the privilege of being a man. So when you have these black women who are fighting for their lives every single day, it's not just a social justice initiative or a social justice campaign or something popular to tweet about on Twitter. It is their real lives. They live these things every single day, especially with a league with so many also mass presenting women, I'm not going to get too deep into it, but that's another added layer of oppression that these players face. And then you have their allies and their teammates who love them, who are speaking up like a Brianna Stewart. It's a movement that they are living in real time, in real life, that is truly their own lives. And I think that's why you see it happen flawlessly. You see it happen organically because that the fight is beyond the court. It's, it's, things that affect everybody that they see every day. 
And unfortunately, Black women do have to carry this country on their backs as we've done for years, but that's exactly what it is. So great job with everyone being on the same page for that today. <laughs> Michael, I, I, I told you, I was excited, excited for the answer because I knew what was coming. I, t I just, this is, this is exactly what I was waiting for. You ask and you, you shall you, receive. You, you want to put the, you want to put the cherry on top of it, Ashley, or you want to go in a different I don't, direction? That, that, that was, that was it. That hey, was it. Leave that alone. Hey, do, do we think it's, uh, do, do we think it's realistic? Um, and and I, I, I know today it, it is about celebration. But I like what you said. Um, I, I like what, what has been said here in this conversation, but it's particularly the point of, uh, hey, let's support. Let's support. Yeah. You know, Tarika, you're, you're there at uh, Connecticut Sun Games. I don't know what the attendance is like. I don't know what the range of people uh, in the audience is like uh, uh, night to night, a game to game. But is, it, is this something that we can build on? If you don't know, like like Micah Parsons tweeted earlier today, he didn't know all the details uh, about prisoner exchanges and about Brittany Griner. He didn't know that, and he got himself into a little bit of trouble on Twitter and tried to walk it back. But there are a lot of people who really can't speak on uh, political systems, but they can go to games. Is it that, like, is that a, is that a small step to take, or if you're going to ask for a step or an initial step, is it is it going to a game or is it something else? I think it's a little. I think it's a little bit of both. What I, what I, uh, Michael, listen. I think it's really interesting how we got people who can't tell you the three branches of government, but they absolutely now know that they are specialized in hostage negotiations. Very interesting to me. But that's another <laughs> topic for another day, right? What I do think though is that everyone has a different way of support. It is not always economically feasible for someone to buy a ticket to go to the game. But it may be even, you know, a little bit more feasible for them to share a player's tweet. It might be easier for them um, to, you know, subscribe to maybe a service online that they like the WNBA League Pass or whatever. There are different ways to support. Um, I think part of that support is also getting to know the players. Um, and part of that is on us as media, right? Like part of that is on us to take the reins and say, we have to do a better job of covering this league from all aspects. We can't even say to ourselves that there are media outlets that have dedicated reporters for every WNBA team that have someone that we can go to as insiders that can give us the scoops on what's happening within these teams within this league. And so it's not just on the general public to take that step to support, but it is also on us as professionals in this business and in this industry to take the support serious, to understand that these numbers that we've seen in terms of growth in this league over the last year and over the last season, that wasn't made up and it didn't come out of nowhere. It's very a simple formula. If we give people the opportunity to see what these players bring, the product that's on the floor, people will genuinely find a way to support in whatever that means for them, whether that's reading an article, whether that's supporting by purchasing merchandise, whether that's buying a ticket, whatever that means to you that's economically feasible for you you, it can be done. We just have to continue to provide the medium and the platform for those things to happen. Think, I think Sabrina? also it's, it, oh yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll close it out. Um, my ask, and I know you're probably going to be like, that's the bare minimum, but it really is the bare minimum. My ask is if you don't have anything knowledgeable, accurate, respectful or nice to say just don't say anything at all mm -hmm. and if you would like to take it a step further more than happy to chat with you if you want to come find me i can tell you about my organization grow the game where we actually give discounted and free tickets to those who cannot afford them or discounted merchandise we try to share all the players um, merch anytime they have an interview coming out anything that you might want to do and you're just like i don't know where to start i am more than happy to help you start there so like i said if you just don't want to support and you're indifferent just don't bash but if you would like to support if you would like to take it a step further i am more than happy to help you individually if that is something that you would like but go to the games like tarika said uh support the players read elevate a tweet anything 
if that's what you want to do. But again, if you don't want to, we are not forcing you. It is okay to just not say anything at all. Can I just My also question. add really also, quick I, to I, that? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I, didn't, <laughs> I just, I, just, I, just, I want to say, go right ahead, Tarika. Go right ahead. I'll close it out. Go ahead. Are you, are you sure? Okay. Cause I know, yeah, I, know yeah, I get yeah. so, I get so passionate and, and, and it is crazy, but I just want to just really quickly just throw out there that, you know, I don't know where we became a, a people where we don't realize that we can walk in true gum at the same time, but it's possible to care about more than one cause at the same time. So I don't think that it's fair for anyone to to feel like celebrating this victory today and celebrating Britney's return is at all a disrespect or a disregard to Paul Whelan's family and any other family that has to deal with a detained member or relative in any country in Russia or others abroad. Those are not, they, like, it is possible for us to understand this is a, a momentous occasion, but there is also still more work to be done. Yes. How often have we as a people have had to say, you know, thank God that this officer was locked up or thank God that this person was found guilty. But that does not mean that we have somehow reached the mountaintop. There's still work to be done. And I just want people to not lose sight of that. Sherelle Griner said today that her and Brittany will still remain committed to ensuring that other detainees will, will have their opportunity or will have an opportunity to have someone to fight on their behalf. And that means a lot. This woman has spent 294 days fighting day in and day out, dealing with the, the missing of the other piece of her. And yet she still had the ability to stand on that podium today and said, even though I've now received my victory, I want to still continue to help and fight for those who have yet to feel what I feel. That's an ama that is an amazing amount of courage and strength. And I don't think that if, if we can come together to understand that it is okay to be excited for one thing and still understand we have tons of work left to do to get to the place we want to be. I think we'd be a better, you know, sense of empathetic people for it. Absolutely, well, Michael, actually... before we go, I just wanna say specifically to the men that I would like them, you know, as you know, they call themselves basketball enthusiasts and they, you know, they have so much admiration for athletes and the things that they can do to stop viewing the WNBA and women's sports in general, but particularly the WNBA, because we're talking about Brittany Griner as an inferior product. I can't respect you as a sports fan, as someone who holds athletes to this high pedestal and you can't respect the W. There is nothing about that that's inferior. And the quicker that that ideology is gone out the window and the quicker it stops being viewed as the stepchild of basketball or just something that they had to do to fill a marginalized group or whatever the case may be, I think also that solves a lot of problems. It's not an inferior product. And if you want to figure out exactly what I mean by that, go watch it. It's really that simple. Mm. Turn on your TV, go to a game, mm. check it out. If you if you don't believe me, the proof is there. That's all I'm saying. So. All right, welcome back to the show. And I just want to point out it is December of 2022. I just want to let you know that because if you're looking at that headline, it says uh, commander's owner toxic workplace. It could be December 2022. It could be December 2021. Ashley It could be uh, December 2017. It could be December 2013. Hey, what I want to say to our, our our brave men and women who are public servants uh, in the House, in the Senate, anybody involved in politics, where y'all been? We told you. <laughs> now you just happen to have a 79 page report on Daniel Snyder talking about how trifling and ignorant he is and talking about how the NFL was complicit in this process, and you have some updated information. But Ashley, I mean, this story some, uh, up, up, is as old is it, is as... A... Right, this story is as old as civilization, isn't it? Yeah, it's, so it's I, honestly infuriating, truthfully. And, and, and let, okay, let's talk about it. It's infuriating to me, too. But why is it infuriating to you? Because why is this man still an owner of an NFL team? Why is he still allowed to leisurely find the right person to buy his team? Why is he still 
in some capacity involved with the Washington com Commanders. My frustration is this, and this is a conversation that we've had a variety of different ways and a variety of different times. We hold our athletes to these high standards, right? I'm going to use the Kyrie situation. Kyrie went ahead and did something that needed to go ahead and be acknowledged. He should have apologized. He didn't. He faced repercussions for it. He went ahead and had a whole other list of criteria of things he needed to do to return to his job, right? But then you have somebody who is responsible for providing a toxic work environment in a variety of different ways, harmful ways, misogynistic ways, xenophobic ways, racist ways. The list goes on and on, and all of a sudden it's, oh, we have to take our time and figure out what happened. We can't just rush the gun. You know, we have to we have to go ahead and, and leisurely do an uh, investigation and, and hope that things come out, you know, and we figure, no, the moral compass, the moral goalpost, if you will, cannot move depending on who does what and when they do it, how they do it, how much money they have when they're doing it. My frustration has always been, it seems that sports leagues, I'm including the NBA in this, I'm including the NFL in this, I'm including the MLB in this, move the goalposts of what's right and what's wrong, depending on who does it. And I understand that in the real world, that that's how yeah. things normally happen. Being white and being a billionaire gives you a lot more freedom than it does being a black ball player. But in a league that's, you know, constantly trying to push this narrative that they are progressive or getting there, you're, you're, contradicting yourself every single turn yeah. you make and that's always my frustration yeah I, and and it's uh, rightfully so uh, Ashley you should be frustrated I, I, I will say I agree with uh, 97 98 99 percent of what you said the one percent where we have a disagreement is here the problem with the NFL and Daniel Snyder and the Washington commanders is that the goalpost have not moved uh, that thing mm. continues to be wide right, wide left. We see it wide right, wide left. He's missing, he's missing, but nobody does anything about it. You don't have an Nothing. official saying no good. You don't have to say, you don't have anybody saying that was your last attempt. It's time to get out. The goalposts haven't moved. We all know what the story is. The NFL has even said, oh, this is the story. The, here's the problem with Daniel Snyder. We don't support it yet. The actions don't back up the words. Nobody has tried to move this around. It's just that they've been in, they've been passive. They, they, it, they've it, taken it, their time. It, they look the other way. There's inaction. It, and it, it's so it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing at this point that the NFL, I don't know if it's fear of Snyder. I don't know why. I don't know why you're afraid of him. There's nothing to be afraid of. And even if he does have some stuff on you, take it for the league. Okay, so if you get Michael, if he even, got some stuff on the, have, he got some Michael, stuff on the even if they have stuff on him, even if they yeah. have stuff on him, there is nothing that he can release that would surprise fans of the NFL at this point. There, the NFL does not have this, you know, squeaky clean yeah. image of just being morally correct and Word. never do. What can you possibly release that we'd be like, oh my god, they did that? I mean, we're, at this point, you're starting yeah. at zero. Yeah, and you're right, Ash. And here's the other thing. Okay, if that happens, even if it is something big, oh wow, we'll just move on. <laughs> I mean, that's that's part of the that that's the strength and and weakness of sports fans. Uh, we'll 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 talk about an issue, and then we move on. So, uh, if, if Daniel Snyder says, "Hey, this owner did that," yeah, we'll be outraged for a second, but then we'll move on to something else. And maybe we'll celebrate because Daniel Snyder is out of the league. So yeah, he told he told this about this guy, but he's no longer a part of that that exclusive club anymore, which is what we I think we all want. I think we all want that. I think Commanders fans want it. I want I think the commissioner wants it. I think other owners want it. Maybe the only owner who doesn't want it is Jerry Jones because He's got the commanders in his division. And generally, when you have the commanders in your division, you got a bad owner like that. It's good for you to have a, a team that's not going to make smart decisions year after year. But for them, you, you get my point. For the most part, yeah. we all want the same thing. So why isn't that thing happening?
That's the question. Why isn't the NFL doing anything substantive about Daniel Snyder? It's it's baffling. You take you have a months long investigation after the first expose comes out, right? And after that investigation, you find out that a lot of what, if not all of what, was in that expose was factual. So that right there should have been the beginning and the end. Except now there's another investigation, and now there's a new report that comes out that's calling it a toxic workplace. We knew this eight months ago. This isn't new information. And when our producers presented this, you know, earlier in the day, I said, "Okay, but we knew this already. I'm expecting something to come out like Dan Snyder being forced to sell the team immediately. He's not able to take his time getting the right route together to purchase his beloved commanders. The team should go up for sale immediately and allow a third party to be responsible for going ahead and dealing with the sale. The fact that this man is still part of workplace operations, team operations, franchise operations after doing a plethora of just disgusting things from top to bottom over a period of time is baffling and it's why fans of sports are frustrated with the fact that athletes are held to these unrealistic standards when at the end of the day they are simply employees of these billionaires who can do whatever the hell they want and nine times out of ten re have no repercussions it's an imbalance in the system that until organizations like the NFL and like the NBA stand their ground and stop moving that goalpost and stop looking the other way that imbalance is only going to continue to get worse Ashley Nicole Moss you have opened my eyes you have opened my eyes and I listen I listen uh, to three beautiful black women about 10 minutes ago tell me how men should listen and we should all listen. This is what black women do. Black women get things done. We've always done that. That's what they said, right? Then I have a black woman say he needs to sell the team immediately. Let's go have a third party get in here and make it happen. So if you put it in the atmosphere, Ashley, maybe that's the news. Maybe that's what we're talking about tomorrow. Maybe I'm going to speak into existence, from another. Michael. <laughs> oh, I like it. I like it because we know you're a big timer. I mean, you're already one of the most influential people in North America. I, I read that in <laughs> Forbes. So you can make things happen. I manifested right? that, didn't I? <laughs> uh, okay. All right. So uh, we got a guest coming up soon. Let's, uh, let's, let's take a break here and then we'll come back and uh, talk with our guests. But I think you're on to something, Ashley. You're on to I usually something. am, Michael. I usually am. I Listen, usually am. <laughs> this is going to happen tomorrow. I'm telling you, it's going to be the story. This is the follow up. The follow up tomorrow is going to be Snyder forced to sell the team immediately. And it's a shame because the commanders are actually playing good football. I like them. It's a good team that deserves a better owner. And according to Ashley Nicole Moss, they're going to get one immediately. We're putting it out there. I'm giving you the lotto numbers off the air. I got you with the lotto numbers. Okay. All right. I hope so. <laughs> I need that. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Listen, that team across the bridge from my New York Knicks almost blew a, well, they did blow a 23-point lead and almost lost to the short-handed Hornets. So we got to discuss that because I can't relate. The Knicks went ahead and blew out the Hawks, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about all that. We have a special guest in the building, somebody who I am very familiar with. We've spoken about the Knicks and the Nets and everything in between. Christian Winfield. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing well, doing well. How are you doing, Nash? How are your Knicks doing these days? Listen, we didn't blow a 23-point lead. I can tell you that much. You, you blew the Donovan Mitchell sweepstakes, though. You could have had him, but you yeah, held well, on to R.J. Barrett. Ooh. Do we want to get into that first, or do we want to get into I the also, No, no, go there. Also, no, get into that. Get I into also, that. Christian, that doesn't hurt me. You know why? Because I also blew Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, Zion. I mean, the list goes on and on. I've, I've been through that before. It doesn't, doesn't, that doesn't hurt my feelings. But I do want to ask you, you know, the unofficial trade deadline is, is approaching. And this is where we start talking about movements and things that can be made. Now, the Nets have 
kind of sort of found a swing and then they've kind of sort of gone backwards. It's been very up and down. They've been dealing with a lot of injuries. Ben Simmons still has not played um, after his upper, I believe it's a calf strain. He's supposed to return on Friday against the Hawks, but there has been concerns on his health, his longevity, and how that's going to go ahead and help Kevin Durant, who your story the other day said that they're trying to go ahead and save this man's legs. He's not 25 years old. They need him in the long run. I know Patty Mills, Mills was a name that was thrown into the mix as a possible trade acquisition to another team, but they said his relationship with the GM and also his relationship with Ben is going to keep him in Brooklyn more than likely. So exactly what is on the table for the Nets to be the team that they need to be in order to make a run in the East? Well, first and foremost, the Nets have to be healthy, right? I think we've seen so many different iterations of this team, and we still haven't seen them play when Ben Simmons is at his full strength. We've seen Ben slowly progressed from the beginning of the season where he couldn't even really sprint, let alone jump and dunk, to now where he's making those plays that we saw him make in the Philadelphia 76ers jersey, where he's pushing the pace, finding his teammates, even dunking putback dunks. He's starting to look like the old Ben Simmons. Now it's just time for this team to kind of learn how they can function. Look, check this out. Last night, uh, the Nets ran a pick and roll where Kevin Durant was handling the ball and Kyrie Irving set the screen. That was the first time we've seen that all season. And they're talking about getting to that more often, but they weren't able to do that because now they're playing these small ball lineups that they have to play when Ben Simmons is out. There's just so much, as they like to call optionality and versatility that this team has that they haven't even been able to get into. So to your earlier point about trade possibilities, uh, you, you know, Patty Mills is someone who's on the outside of the rotation right now and understands that, you know, he's behind Seth Curry, even Cam Thomas, who's a second year guard in the in the depth chart. But his relationship with Ben Simmons, I, I'm not sure I can see him being moved on top of the fact that the Nets just signed him to a two year deal, uh, just under 15 million. Uh, I, I think the Nets, obviously, they need another big man on the roster, right? We're seeing Nick Claxton, he's, he's coming into his own. But I think more than any other deal, this team just needs time to play and, and figure out what works for them. You know what? Uh, th there are many, uh, many times when we we have these top ten lists uh, in the NBA. Christian uh, always NBA fans do it all the time. And the list, I, I love this. A, a good NBA fan has a fluid top ten list. You know, you got your list in <laughs> September, you got your list in December, uh, you got your list right before the playoffs, and then and then the playoffs, the list changes again. So, a hey, Kevin Durant has always been in my top five. He's been in my top five. He's still in my top Forever. five. Yes. Uh, despite 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 the team uh, being a little broken around him, but yesterday on brother from another Christian, I got to hit your opinion on this, and I'm gonna hear Ashley talk about it. Yesterday, I heard that H. Rod Blakely said Jason Tatum is the best player in basketball. Now I live in Boston. I like the Celtics. I like right Jason now? Tatum. I have never thought that even right now. He's the best player in the league. Would you say, uh, what do you say to that? Is, is Jason Tatum playing so well that he's the best player in the league? He's definitely uh, the MVP right now, for sure. I, but, I mean, I, I think. Is he, the, is he the best player in basketball? That's the no, that's difference. The MVP. Is, he, no. is he the best player in the game? Now, I think first and foremost, we got to find out what Asha Rod Blakely's drink of choice is. I think I need to order that <laughs> when I go to the bar. Listen, Jason Tatum is amazing. I I've watched him dominate basketball games. I just think there's a different level, right? We're talking about the Giannis. We're talking about Kevin Durant. We're talking about Luka Doncic when he gets hot, right? We're talk and, and maybe less so Luka because to get to that level, we're talking about players who have been on championship teams, right? Who have put a team on their back and carried them. And obviously, that's a knock on Kevin Durant, right? Oh, he went to Golden State and, and he went to an already made contender. But when the playoffs came around, when the NBA Finals came around, that ball was in Kevin Durant's hands, and he delivered time and time again over LeBron James. We all saw the shots. Um, I, I, I love Jason Tatum. I love his game. I think he's going to be the face of the league for a long time. I think there's another step he's got to get to. They took a step last year, get into the NBA Finals. Next time, for him to really be considered one of the best, the best player in, in basketball, he's got to win that that championship. I think Jason Tatum is also a product of his environment. And what I mean by that is he has been in a situation that has, for the most part, been very stable. 
you know, that team has not gone through a lot of changes as he's kind of elevated and grown in his career. You look at this team now, it's virtually the same as last year. Obviously, the coaching and, you know, the Ime Yudoka situation was a lot, but they have a great new head coach. But the guys around him on that court in battle with him for four quarters have pretty much remained the same as he's hit his peak or as he's starting to hit his peak these past two seasons. You look at Kevin Durant's situation in Brooklyn, it's been a lot of turmoil, not just from a front office standpoint. He's not playing with the same guys. I mean, it's hard to build a repertoire. It's hard to build a, a just muscle memory, if you will. It's hard to go ahead and be in battle with guys that you're getting familiar with all over again. Yes, Kyrie was there, but he wasn't really there. James Harden was there. And now he's gone. Ben Simmons is there, but he's sometimes there. And then you have a bunch of other guys he's also getting used to. I think you put Kevin Durant in the same situation that you, J, uh, Jason Tatum is in right now. You see a drastically different Kevin Durant. You see a drastically mm. different Brooklyn Nets team. That is not the hand that he has been dealt. Those are not his cards. And that makes all of the difference. But while I do think Jason Tatum is hitting his stride as a player, you cannot negate the fact that his environment is a big reason for that as well. You, you know, kind of like fine wine, after your takes get better with time. Uh, you know, Jason Tatum, obviously, you look at last season, a lot of people like wanted to point at Ime Udoka as the reason that that Celtics team made that NBA Finals run. The Celtics are on pace to do it again this year, right? And you're looking at that Bucks team, you're looking at Chris Middleton working them back into rotation, Giannis being fully healthy, those guys getting in. That's the same. I, I think the two teams to beat in the NBA this season are in the Eastern Conference. I think Milwaukee and, and Boston. I mean, we just watched Boston hand it to Phoenix the other night, right? I think I think Milwaukee and Boston are heads headed are head above everybody else in the league. Uh and, and Jason Tatum just being that star that you could depend on a night to night basis. Even when we're talking about consistency, that coaching change, nobody saw that coming. And for the Celtics to still be basically picking up where they left off last year. I mean, you got to tip your hat to him. You said uh, the two teams in the East to beat. Uh, you named Milwaukee and Boston. Uh, this is for Ashley. You ain't said nothing about the Knicks. Um, yeah, well, you not? know, yeah. it's fine. I don't see. I'm I mean, not, what is that there to say? My, that doesn't hurt Hello. my feelings. We're trying, I, don't, I don't have we're to trying to bait you. We're trying to bait you, Ashley. We're just trying to feelings. bait you. You know, like, as long are, as you, are you a real Knicks fan? If you don't get offended, I'm a real Knicks fan. Oh, I'm a real Knicks fan. I don't, I don't have I don't have false delusions of a parade on Seventh Avenue anytime soon. I know that's not in my cards. I know that's not in my future. Oh, that's okay. Oh, <laughs> they can't hurt I mean, me anymore. This Knicks team. Ash, actually, let me flip it on you, Ash. I have a question. Do, do we've seen Tom Thibodeau with this young group long enough? Do you think that he's the problem? Is it a Julius Randle problem? Where, where, if you have a pie chart to to kind of break up the blame, where do you put the blame for this? For this, it's another failed season that you guys are gonna have. There's a few things. It's a, it's a season of, I think Tibbs and his rotations are still a problem. I think Julius Randle is still an important piece of this team, but there's not enough around him. He's not a number one option. And lastly, I just don't know if this team knows what direction they're going. Are you fighting to be a playoff contender? Are you fighting to win a championship? Or are you okay with rebuilding and trying to figure that out? I just don't know if this team knows what their identity is, what the game plan is. And that comes from the front office. That comes from the higher ups. But in terms of what's going on on the court, I mean, you can only do so much with what you have. And I think that the guys don't really, there's no leader on that team yet. There's not that number one guy. You thought it was RJ Barrett. Doesn't look like it's gonna be RJ Barrett. Jalen Brunson's not the savior. Julius Randle's not a number one option. You're still missing Ashley. that guy. We don't have our Kevin Durant, Ashley. if you will. Ashley, like the Knicks, our conversation is about to be eliminated. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's where I go. Out that's out where it is. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Uh, Christian, we appreciate you, brother. Thank you so of much. Of course. Anytime, <laughs> guys. Anytime. So, Ashley, I've mentioned it before. There you go. Impressive. Oh. Under. All right. Forbes under 30 list. So, just tell me uh, your initial thoughts when you found out about it. It was incredible. It was a huge surprise. You know, I want, I've always wanted to make the list. It was on my vision board since high school and, you know, making it in the, in the 11th hour was such an honor. It's, it's an honor to be part of such an, a, 
incredible group of people who have done it before me. And it reminds you, uh, reminds me rather of every place that I've been and all the places that I'm going. So thank you for, I love it. I appreciate it. And you'll it. continue to take our phone calls. Now we can, we can address you directly. We can make Maybe not yours. Our next show you hurt my feelings. Hey, thanks for watching brother from another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave and be sure to watch us three to 5 PM Eastern time on Peacock. Appreciate you.